Amen, family. Well, good morning to you all. It's a beautiful morning. I hope you guys got some well-deserved uh, sleep there. I know we lost an hour, but uh, when you wake up with Jesus, you feel like you're just fired up no matter if you lost an hour or not. Amen. But uh, it's going to be an incredible service uh, today. I, I'm really grateful for everyone that's been uh, sharing and uh, Sandra for your communion, uh, Jose for your contribution, your guys' convictions, your hearts. Uh, I just love being with the family. If you're joining with us this morning, I hope you feel the love and you feel the virtual hug that we're trying to give you right there. And um, we're really grateful to be here together. Uh, and one quick announcement that uh, just uh, we want to make sure everyone knows, it's really for the campus, is this Saturday, upcoming Saturday, is the campus Mercy uh, Day Out. So you'll be serving the community this Saturday along with Sandra and the Mercy team. And so please make sure that you... Uh, Connect with Sandra and Tomataka and uh, everyone else that's going to be out there helping to serve. Uh, that would be very helpful uh, to have a great group. But um, I hope you guys are doing well. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 9. We're going to jump into the word here. It's been a fun but busy weekend, that is for sure. Uh, we had the campus devotional on Friday night where... Uh, not only did the campus here in Portland, but Eugene, Seattle, Indianapolis, Milwaukee, Chicago, Columbus, Toronto. We were all together on Zoom. We hung out for two hours. We heard some incredible lessons. And then right after that, Shauna and I ran on over. Shauna preached a sermon to the Spanish women for their Devo. I got to preach to the, the men in the Spanish region for their Devo. Uh, we had a great night there, and then uh, Saturday we had a very busy day out reaching out, hanging out at the food trucks, meeting people, getting to some great Bible studies, and uh, it was just a fun, fulfilled weekend. Uh, as Jose liked to remind me, I I, uh, I lost money yesterday playing Loteria. We just played for a dollar, and it was a fun little time just to have a little stakes, and I got a phone call at the end of the game, and I got up to answer the call, and Jose reminded me I didn't pay him his uh, his his winnings. So I made sure I sent that to him as he was sharing the contribution message, amen, to help him out with his contro. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians 9, guys, we're actually today, we're going to put Exodus on pause, and next week we'll pick back up with probably chapter 6 and chapter 7. But there's some things I just wanted to address, and uh, I think we could really use here this morning. And in 1 Corinthians 9, and verse 24, the Bible says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will last, or that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly, and I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. You know, I love this scripture and it just talks a lot about different, different sports and competing and uh, not, not just running aimlessly, not being a boxer who just beats the air. So uh, Oscar, when I walk in on him at the gym and he says he's shadow boxing, really, I just share this scripture with him. I'm like, bro, it's pointless. I don't know what you're doing, bro. But uh, I'm just kidding. But the reality is, is I love this scripture here. And, and there's a few quotes I wanted to share with you. Muhammad Ali said, you know, one of the greatest fighters out there, he, he said, I hated every minute of training. But I said, don't quit. Suffer now and live the rest of your life as a champion. And he did. He, he's gone down in history as one of the greatest fighters. Uh, a few other quotes there are is only he who can see the invisible can do the impossible. Uh, there may be people that have more talent than you, but there's no excuse for anyone to work harder than you. You know, the title of this morning's lesson is going to be a crown that will last. A crown that will last. We've got to really make sure that we're competing for the right things, that we're fighting for the right things, that the desires in our hearts and, and our purpose and what we chase and pursue after is for the right things. A crown that will truly last. You know, we live in a world that doesn't understand this concept, a, a world that just doesn't agree with this concept, right? The scripture here is teaching that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. See, the world doesn't accept this. Nowadays, all runners run and all runners get a prize, right? Shoot, in some cases, you could walk and still end up with a trophy, 
But thanks for showing up. We're glad you came. And here's the medal for coming. And don't cry. It's okay. It's the same as the guy that got first place. Right? It's everyone got the same thing. And see, people just don't understand this concept anymore. You know, and I believe that that's why in the, in the world there can be such an illusion and confusion and lack of uh, understanding of heaven and hell. Right? Because everyone wants to understand that you can just do whatever you want and still end up with a prize. You can live however you want and still end up with a prize. You know, it's, it's, it's scary to think, but I have never been to a, a funeral in my life that somebody was clearly not mentioned that they were in a better spot. There's just no way. The mindset is just, it, it is always that they've gone to somewhere better. You don't want to believe that you have to run in a way to get the prize. We want to be like, no, the, the, however they ran, it doesn't matter, but they're in a better spot. They got the prize. They want to believe that you should do you and you can perform however you want and don't worry, you'll get to where you need to be. But man, how far the world and people have drifted. It is made clear here, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he says, you must run in a way to get the prize. Meaning there is a certain way you must compete in order to qualify for this prize. And it goes on to share that those who compete go into strict training. That that is a statement, not a suggestion. So it's not like, hey, if you want to compete, you, you may want to train. No, no, no. If you're going to compete, then you will go into strict training. See, to can be qualified for a marathon, you have to enter in and have a good enough run time to be approved. Once you're approved, you then have to work even harder now to prepare for that marathon. Right? It's awesome to have uh, Reese's older brother here, Jackson. Jackson's a runner. Uh, yeah, calling you out there, Jackson. He's a, he's a runner. He'll travel all around the world to go to these places and compete to run. Right? But he can't, I can't do that. I mean, I, I could if I trained, but I can't do that because I don't train. I can't just show up and be like, all right, Jackson, bring it. I got you. He's going to laugh at me and leave me in the dust. He'll probably lap me at least twice. Right? And so the reality is there is, <laughs> yeah, especially not with my sprained ankle, but the reality is you're, there's strict training that has to go into it. You know, I got to ask you guys, are, are you training strictly in your walk with God? Many of us want to quickly say, of course I'm training. Well, is it strict training or is it kind of lackadaisical training? You know, I, I love Oscar. He's been in my life for about six years now. He was, he was the first disciple to hold Eli after he was born uh, he, he, he's come to Portland with us. He's like a, a, a dear brother, but he knows when I'm building him up here that, that I'm going to pick on him a little bit, but you know, we've been working out together. It's been great going to the gym and we're lifting weights together and just bonding over the weights. And, and yet I love challenging him. Just saying, bro, like you gotta, you gotta train a little stricter. Stop eating the hot Cheetos. Stop looking for those, those muffins. Where's the diet at? And we started talking about it. And now all of a sudden he's eating healthy and he's like, bro, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling, look at me. He's walking in the plasma and people at plasma are like, whoa, you're big. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, the, the, this machine doesn't usually work on the lean guys. Right? Oscar's getting all embarrassed because he's like, man, I'm just trying to get in shape. But people are calling me out left and right. And I'm really proud of his hard work and training. But there's a difference between training and strict training. You know, are you training strictly in your walk with God? You know, the truth is, if you're not training strictly, it's clear you're not serious about competing. You know, you may hear a lot about the Super Bowl. You, you may think about the Super Bowl a lot. You may even attend the Super Bowl. But none of that means you're competing in the Super Bowl. You know, it's the same with our walks with God. You may hear a lot about God. You may even think a lot about God. You may even attend a lot of services for God. And yet none of that means you're qualified for the race. You know, family, are you running in such a way as to get the crown? Now, we know corona means crown, but we're not talking about corona, amen? We're talking about the crown that will last forever, amen? Turn me to Matthew 28. 
the scripture we all know very well. Point number one is let's get qualified. Let's get qualified. Come on, Pete. Matthew 28. In verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came unto them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, I love this scripture. He's hanging out with his disciples. He's resurrected. He's talking to them. And then it says, and yet some still doubted. Some still doubted. They're sitting there before the resurrected Jesus, just unsure about what is going on, about really giving their full heart, about fully investing. And Jesus doesn't even address it. He gives them the greatest commission in the world. He said, you, you, better, you better just stay faithful, go make disciples. Get up and start doing the work. And I think that's just so cool because as you live it out, you would just be fully convinced. He knew what was going to fix their doubt. That when they get into a Bible study with somebody, when they're wrestling in the scriptures with somebody, when they're praying for somebody to make it and they're bonding with them and they're helping them through life challenges and they just draw close to them, that it would help them overcome their doubt. But he says that, hey, I, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go make disciples of all nations. I love to think that we're a church of all nations. To understand that we're a church of all nations. That we're not focused on, on one race or making sure that we just really build up this corner of the church or, okay, the, this is that service, this is this service. No, we're all nations. I love scrolling through the screen and being able to see that. And then it says to go, and after you make them into a true disciple, you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then it's teaching them to obey everything that God has commanded. There is a mindset about teaching to obey. This is the command from God. This isn't like, great, you got baptized. All right, go live your salvation on your own. Good luck. See you around. Have fun. Do your thing. People wonder, why, why are you so involved in my life? Well, I don't know. The God called me to teach you to obey things. And, and for, you know, 1 Corinthians says that we belong to one another and, and that we're a body and we're a family. And I, I just, I, if you belong to me, I care about you. I want to help you. It's like, stop getting so involved. Uh, what do you want me to do? This is what the Bible's telling us to do. And we try to like Americanize Christianity. Like I need a personal bubble. Like you're too invested. Why do you know so much about my life? It's because we're family. We belong to each other. If my son doesn't show up to family dinners, I'm concerned. Right? If, if it doesn't look like you have a happy, I, we have this thing in the house called a happy heart. So I, when Eli's all upset, I say, hey, show me, show me your happy heart. And he's all crying. He tries to smile like this. Like it's like a forced smile. But he's trying to get his heart to be happy. But, but this is the thing. Once I see there's not a happy heart, I'm like, what, what's going on? Where, where, what, what's happened, Eli? Where's your happy heart? You know, but it's so cool that Jesus wants every person to become a disciple. He doesn't say go run into disciples. He doesn't even say go find disciples. Go make. It's a process. Yes. Come on, bro. It's a process. Right? And this is a continued process to grow, to help people to make you into stronger disciples, to a deeper conviction. But he doesn't say go make Baptists, go make Catholics, go make Mormons. He doesn't even say go make Christians. Jesus wants every single person to become a true disciple of him. Now, this is what we must become if we desire a relationship with God. You cannot simply assume that this is who you are because you feel like it. As much as I felt like a good basketball player growing up, I was pretty decent. And I thought in my head I was going to make it to the league. My stepmom just had to sit me down and say, Preston, what are your life plans? I said, I'm going to play ball. No, no, no. What are your real life plans? You're not going to play ball. Like, let's come up with a logical plan here. <laughs> like, whoa, all right. Thanks for just telling me straight. As much as I felt like it, the truth was I had to see through it. I wasn't a good player. I just needed to hear it. You know, if Shauna wants a loving and gentle and serving husband, I can't just say, well, here I am. I need to make sure that's who I become. 
Now, being a disciple is something that you're made into. It's not something you just wake up as, not something you're born as, something we're made into. Check out 2 Timothy chapter 3. There's a few scriptures here I want us to cover. Second Corinthians three and verse sixteen. It says all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, some of us have been disciples for a little while and we go through these scriptures and we use this to help teach conviction and build conviction into the, the those we study with. But sometimes I forget, I think we forget to apply these scriptures back to our hearts, back to our lives. To remember that all scripture is from the mouth of God. And if you have a reverence for God, you can read one scripture and be convicted, inspired, and ready to change and do what that, that scripture says. We don't need a whole Bible study series on why to be patient or a whole Bible study series on, on why we should be sacrificial, on why we should make disciples or why we shouldn't be late. We, one scripture, it's like, man, you're right. I got to just, there it is. That's all I needed. God said it one time. I don't need him to say it more to me. I don't need to hear a whole 45 minute lesson on it. I just, I'm going to repent and I'm going to be a man that, or a woman that loves God. And here it says that all scripture is useful. It's only useful if you're applying it to your life. It's not useful to own a big old Bible and let it sit there on the, uh, on the desk next to you and touch it every morning and feel great that you have a Bible at home too and have no idea the version and you've never opened it. It's, you know, like, I, I love the saying, like a, a worn out Bible means a healthy soul, right? You, you ever see those people with those Bibles and it look, looks like it's just gone through war and back? Like, man, how long you had that thing? I think you can get the duct tape around. I've seen people use duct tape as new covers because it's been falling apart. You want to go buy a new one? No, this is my baby. This is it. I'm not letting this one go. And they just love it. And it just shows they're using it. And they're in it. And, and they're wrestling with the stuff. And they're, they're constantly carrying it with them to just get applied into their life. You know, but are you, are you allowing the scriptures to still be useful in your life? Are they still teaching you? And I asked the Spanish region, I said, man, when's the last time you've been rebuked? And some people are like, oh, man, it's been a long time since I've been, been rebuked. Well, that's humbling to say because it just shows that you're, you're not allowing yourself to become equipped for every good work. Because the moment we stop allowing the Bible to rebuke us, correct us, we're like, hey, we're, stopped really, we're not getting equipped for every good work. We're not fully trained here. Right? I, I, I'm constantly getting it, constantly getting corrected, challenged, inspired, training. And that's what I love. You know, a lot of these things, teaching, correcting, and rebuked, are, are coming from, as you read, or coming from somebody involved in your life, helping you through the scriptures. That training comes down to your personal choice. Are you willing to train in the scriptures? Are you willing to work hard? Are you putting the right, right effort into your relationship with God? Now, the world will say a bunch of crazy things. and They'll say, man, this investment, that involved, people that involved into your life, that it's definitely a cult. Why are they so involved in your life? Why do they care so much? Why are they actually telling you to obey the Bible? People get offended that you call them to obey the scriptures. They're like, what? You can't call me to do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm calling myself to do it too. Like we all got to do it. It's not, I didn't, I didn't come up with these rules or these standards. I just want us to all live like Jesus. Yeah, come on, bro. And the whole point is so that we can be thoroughly equipped. You know, how's it going really training in the scriptures? In order to be a great disciple, we got to make sure that we stay consistent in our training and our walks with God. You know, check out this scripture here in Luke chapter 9. Come on, Preston. You know, I love the, the training concept because sometimes we can feel like we've arrived and we stop training. We've like, we've hit this level of discipleship and we're like, and I've been a disciple for years. Now it's just about helping other people train. And we stop digging in depth and getting insight and incredible understanding of scripture and 
all this stuff, you know, learning more context and deeper stuff. And I love it. I love hearing lessons from like Joel Parlor when he gives these like nuggets of stuff that you've no idea, you've never even heard about, but you've read that scripture like 40 times. All right? I love hearing those insights because it just shows there's somebody in depth and really training, wanting more understanding. You know, in a scripture that's really powerful to me in Luke 9, verse 23, it says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? You know, this is applied to anybody in the world. And if you want to be Jesus' disciple then the standard is that you must deny yourself. There's a lifestyle of self-denial. So this isn't just to all of a sudden get entered in as a disciple, like, oh, okay, good, I denied myself here. I'm good for the rest of my life. No, it's a lifestyle that you live. There's gonna be many moments where your flesh or your desire doesn't wanna do the right thing, and so you deny yourself to go do the right thing. Man, I just, I don't wanna wake up early and read my Bible here and pray. I just... Let me get 30 more minutes and just run straight to work. It's like, no, you're just going to deny yourself and do it. I don't want to talk to anybody on the train today about Jesus. No, I'm going to deny myself and I'm going to do it. All right? Like, I, I don't want to be in a Bible study. I don't want to be up late helping somebody learn about Jesus. I got, I got school or I got work in the morning. I'm going to deny myself and, and do what I need to do. It was, fun. it was so fun last night. It was such a busy day yesterday. But it was so fun last night hanging out at Osvaldo and Fabi's, and we got to eat some incredible um, uh, shrimp tacos, which was amazing. I, I won't tell you how many I had, but it was more than five, that was for sure. And we just had an incredible meal. And then afterwards, Priscilla and America show up, and we're, pray we're playing Loteria. We're just having a blast, and it's fun. But then we hop in the truck with Jose, Mishan and Jose and Eli, and I just told Jose, I was like, man, this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about, you know? And I, I, I really think, like, helping them to see, like, man, this is what it's all about, building family, having fun with one another, just showing everyone we love them, and that we just have, staying up late. He had homework to do. He, 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 had, he had things to get done, and yet he's getting home at 1130 at night, and he's like, man, you know what? You're right. This is what it's all about. I was like, bro, you can pass every ICCM test, but if you don't do this, what's the point? If we don't physically love people, you may know every scripture in the Bible, but if we're not living it out and making it an action, passing the tests are pointless. You know, we gotta really live a life of self-denial. You know, maybe you feel like, I don't wanna turn my camera on on Sundays because I just don't wanna be that invested in the service on Sundays. I wanna challenge you to deny yourself there a little bit and, and turn the camera on. Show that you're here that you're invested in the service, right? Watch, when the coronavirus is over, we're all showing up in person. You can't show up with a bag over your head. You're gonna have to be there. You're actually gonna have to be there at service and physically show your face. But it's just the conviction to say, hey, I'm gonna be here and I'm gonna be invested. You know, I just wanna quote a scripture here. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse four says that it's a better a living dog than a dead lion. It's better to be a living dog than a dead lion. You know, people are scared to do this because their desire is for a crown that won't last. People would rather chase becoming the lion that's going to die instead of just totally surrendering their life to Jesus and allowing him to be the one in charge and yet get to be a great living dog. You know, we chase treasures that will die away. You know, the first question we need to ask ourselves is that, am I qualified as a true disciple? Am I truly qualified as a disciple? Or do I just think, talk, or do a lot around God? I, I want to inspire you to get into Bible studies. Really get into and let the Bible inspire you. This isn't our opinions. This isn't our suggestions. You will go through a bunch of Bible studies that will help you get molded into a man or a woman of God by the scriptures. Allow, allow the scriptures to be applied to your life and mold you. You know, let's go on to point number two, simply distracted or deeply focused. You know, when you compete towards a goal, you got to stay focused to achieve it. Turn me to Luke 13. 
You got to stay focused in order to achieve your goal. And so we got to wonder if, if, are you simply distracted or are you deeply focused? You know, you're not going to do well if you get distracted and stop working towards your goal. And all the college students know what I'm talking about, right? And you try to do your homework and then whatever, you just find your way back onto Instagram or you find your way back onto social media for a second or man, maybe I'll just watch the second episode of that series right there and uh, I'll start homework again after, and you just start to get yourself distracted. Y'all know what it's like. Everyone knows. You start to just, you want to distract yourself, right? And we stop working towards those goals. Jesus here in Luke 13 was deeply focused on reaching his goal. In Luke 13, in verse 32, Jesus says, go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons. I will heal people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. He didn't say, I hope to reach my goal, or uh, I might finish my goal, or I'm going to try to finish my goal. He's like, I'm going to finish it here. Third day, done. This is my focus. This is my determination. Look what happens here in Matthew 16. Peter and him are traveling along with the disciples, and they're, they're really good friends, and you know they've been walking together. And look, Matthew 16 and verse 23 Jesus, or look at verse 22. It says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Peter's now trying to rebuke Jesus. He says, never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Verse 23, Jesus turned to say to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And Jesus was so focused on his goal that even when his friend tried to slow him down from living out God's will, he called him Satan. How would you feel hanging out with Jesus for the last three years and he turns around and calls you Satan? And get behind me, dude. It's like, bro, I thought we were tight. Like, I've been give, I gave up my whole fisherman job for you. I was, I was all invested. Like, I just don't want you to die. And he's like, dude, you have the things of man in, in mind, not of God. I think so oftentimes with good intentions, we strive to hold people back from being the best they can be for God or even ourselves because our focus is more about the things of men than of God. We're so focused on the wrong things in the wrong area. And Jesus was so focused on his goal, so focused on what God desired for his life, that nobody was going to sway him to do otherwise. By Matthew 26, in verse 46, he's praying for three hours to get his heart behind doing the will of God. Because he's wrestling, finishing the goal. Wrestling doing what he needs to do. And by verse 46 in the garden, he says, rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. He is focused and he was ready to handle and get the job done. You know, brothers and sisters, are you focused? Are you truly focused? Are you zeroed in on how God wants to use you? On what really matters in this life? What has the most influence over you? Is it the words of God or the words of man? You know, when I, when I was a young disciple and I, I read persecution online, I start to feel the words of man pulling my heart away from all of the words of God I just learned. And I just started to realize, man, it's weird how all of a sudden people can have a greater influence over all the scriptures I just learned. The point here is that the word is meant to help keep us focused and guided. But you can't stay at home and sit in a beanbag chair eating Cheetos, you still need to make an effort and do the proper actions to have a great outcome. But what influences you every day? Is it the world or is it God? Too many people make decisions on what other people think. So you do this because you think people will find it attractive, or you do that because you think people will give you the likes, or you do this because you think they'll accept you. And at the end of the day, it's really not what you wanted to do. And so people, so many people in the world get so stuck by being influenced by the world that though in fact they are actually born to influence the world. Every single person here, you are not meant to be influenced by the world. You were created to influence the world, to inspire them. God says you're meant to be a light, put on a, on a hill to shine brightly. He wants to do great things for you. If you were meant to be nothing, you would have been the last person made into a disciple in this world. 
and then Jesus would have came back. It was like, here you go, you know, you're not really useful to advance the kingdom, but um, we'll get you there at the very end. He says, I'm going to take you right now, while it's still young, it's, it's small, the English ministry is 50 people, and I want to use you right now to get their thousands of people, the millions of people left, the billions of people around the world. I want to use you to do that, and I believe you can get it done. But are you allowing God to use you to influence the world? You know, we have a great mission ahead of us. Our mission is to put a church in every city in the world. And yet, at, yet we are focused. But are you focused on getting the job done as well? You got to eat the dream. You got to sleep the dream. You got to be able to see it even when no one else does. You know, the truth is evil reigns when good men stand by and do nothing. And yet the truth is, it, it, it will be very hard. But don't stop when it gets hard, stop when it's done. You know, Peter thought he was focused. Peter thought he was drilled into the plan. Check out Matthew 26, verse 47. It says, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and club. And he sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once Jesus, uh, to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for the sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call my, on my father and he will not at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with me with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Now those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. You know, when you lose focus, you just do the wrong things. You, you end up doing the wrong things and you do things the wrong way. You know, Peter here, all of a sudden, they go to arrest Jesus, and Peter's ready to just start chopping people up into bits and pieces. He's ready to, to cut them up. He was ready to fight for Jesus. See, Peter strove to fight, but he wasn't called to fight physically. He was called to fight spiritually and emotionally. But Peter wasn't ready to suffer for Jesus. He was ready to go down with a fight. But he wasn't willing to sit there and, and, and go through some suffering. And this is where he gets corrected by Jesus. You know, when we're not focused, we end up trying to do things the wrong way. You know, Peter, that ends up leading to Peter following Jesus at a distance. And I think sometimes when we feel the correction of God, instead of getting fully invested again and learning from it, we start to pull back. We pull our hearts back. Instead of being fully invested still and giving our full heart and learning from it and getting better, we start following Jesus at a distance where people may not consider me a disciple from the world because I don't want to have my hurt, my feelings hurt, but the disciples wouldn't say I'm necessarily not a disciple anymore because I'm still kind of following Jesus. Like I can see Jesus, but the crowds around them may not think I'm a disciple. He was following them at a very safe distance to where he was playing both sides of the party. The crowd wasn't sure if he was a disciple or not, but in his heart, I know he felt good that he was kind of following Jesus and didn't feel like he abandoned him like everyone else. You know, Has your mistakes or has any area in your life, the correction you've gotten or whatever's come into your life, your stumbling block, caused you to start following Jesus at a distance? Or are you still up close and personal with him? Are you still tied and tight? Are you with him no matter what? Because you got to remember, Jesus wants to be with you no matter what. He says, I will be with you wherever you go until the end of the age. Those moments when you're feeling sad, he wants to be with you. Those moments you're struggling and feeling like you don't know what to do, he wants to be with you. He's with you. He wants you to run after him. 
But are you simply distracted or deeply focused? You know, scripture goes on, but look here in verse 69. Point number three is, are you a quitter or a fighter? Verse 69 says, now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the great gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you were on one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. You know, this always is interesting here. Peter denied Jesus three times. He denied him three times because it got hard for him. He had to learn to fight a fight he couldn't deal with with anger. You know, becoming a disciple was so different for me because the moment I felt opposition or uh, I felt weirdness, I usually in the world would either just ignore the person or deal with it with anger. Like just get really mean and control the situation. And then becoming a disciple, like to go talk to somebody and be like, hey, uh, I just I just want to clarify this, Malik. Like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I just kind of feel weird. And I feel like you're upset. I feel like when you said those things, it hurt my feelings. And then you're trying to talk through this with love and patience and you know, like I just feel nervous and naturally I just wanted to put walls up. And yet Peter's trying to relearn all of this stuff. He had to learn to fight a fight that wasn't to be fought with anger, but fought with love. And yet it's interesting. He gets, he's getting called out. Hey, you're with Jesus, weren't you? You were with Jesus, weren't you? You're with Jesus, weren't you? And by the third time he gets so indignant. And I think it's so funny, like, when the truth, the truth is obvious. It's just obvious. They're like, dude, your accent's giving you away. You know what's funny sometimes is, like, when we're, like, trying to hide things or, like, we're trying to uh, live in sin and it's, like, just super obvious. And it's like, dude, what's going on over here? Like, what's going on in your life? Like, it, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't even, you're coming up with these stories, but it doesn't even, that doesn't even click. And then they, you just start getting more angry. It's like, no, that's what happened. No, this is what's going on. And it's like all right, you know, like, you know, but it's just like exactly where Peter was at, trying to hide things that were obvious, right? We got to stop just trying to hide things. Just let's be real. This should be open. Get the help you need earlier on and don't wait to be humbled by God. Just let's say, hey, you know what? You're right. I, I, I messed up here. I made some mistake. I need help in this area. But when you start hiding things and trying to like weasel in and out and around and it becomes about people and you're not here for God at all. You're trying to get the acceptance of people and, and it's got to be about God. Don't, don't worry. Charles will love you all the time. Paul will love you forever. It's, we're going to look past it, right? Carrie will still be your sister. We'll still take care of you. We'll still love you. But just be honest and get the help you need. Don't, don't let the sin get you to feel like you got to distance yourself or hide or, or, or not be truthful about it. You know, a lot of people leave their walks with God because it just gets hard. It gets tough. Except God never promised easy. He only promised worth it. That it would be worth it. It would be worth the fight. You know, a lot of things in this life are hard, but not, not a lot of them are very worth it. Not a lot of the things are worth it. That at the end of the day, when you put the picture to it, it's not worth it compared to your fight with God. We'll fight for a lot of things in this world. And yet at the end of the day, it's like, I just, I don't know. Maybe I'll come back to the whole God thing later. Is it really worth fighting for now? Absolutely. It's the only thing worth fighting for right now. It's the greatest thing worth fighting for right now. Turn me to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to start coming to a close here. Hebrews 12. Come on, Preston. In verse 5. Preach. It says, have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? All right, so that one sentence literally is saying what comes next, it should be taken as encouragement. It should feel good. It should feel awesome to read these words of encouragement. Forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father or addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves 
and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Now, don't you feel encouraged after reading that? Some of us still aren't figuring that one out. They're like, I don't know, man. I'm not that fired up after that. What are you talking about? Oh, look at this. It says in verse 7, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. Now, for what children are not disciplined by their father? Now, if you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are just not a legitimate, not a true son and daughter at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Some of us are like, I don't know. I just, I don't got no peace in my life. But you're probably just not letting yourself get trained. You stop getting trained by the, uh, the, the hardships and you just started getting bitter with them. You started getting mad and resentful towards them and you stopped letting them to train you. They are meant to train you. The Bible says there's three options that come when you go through hardship. You lose heart, you take it lightly, or you let it train you. You have the choice. I love this scripture. I share it a lot because there are hardships and you need to learn to properly respond to them. It's okay to be honest. Be like, Man, I'm feeling it right now. This is a good battle. I'm feeling the hardship. But I'm going to let it train me. I'm going to let it train me. See, when you lose heart, you just want to throw in the towel. And yet God didn't create you or, or call you to his kingdom just so you could throw in the towel. He knows it was going to be tough, but he wanted to help you to go even the, the extra mile to achieve even greater things. Don't, don't lose heart, but don't take it lightly either. When you go through hardship, don't just brush off the lessons that God's trying to teach you. God, God loves you so much, but he wants to keep forming you into that man or woman he's always called you to be. That's his desire. That, that's what he, he wants to do. You know, do you brush the hardship aside? Maybe when you lose in a game, are you quick to give up? Maybe you've lost heart. Are you quick to lose hope in times of trouble? You know, hope is being able to see that there is a light despite all the darkness around. Do you still have hope? Are you still able to understand how much God wants to use you and he's training you? Don't quit. Be the fighter he wants you to be. Get resilient. Get stronger. Become tough. Get a softer heart. Become more compassionate. Become more empathetic towards people and caring. God is forming and molding you to be just like his son. And Jesus became perfect. And he learned obedience through the suffering he had to endure. A lot of us want to be like Christ without the suffering. <laughs> we want, teach me to be like Jesus. And then he's like, all right. Well, Jesus became perfect through all the hardship. So here you go. It's like, no, no, take the hardship away. Take it away. Take it away. <laughs> Don't Stop praying for him to take it away and just pray to get through it. Pray to learn the lessons. Stop praying to avoid the cross and pray to be able to handle the cross. Pray to be able to get the strength to carry it, not just put it down and avoid it. I want us to understand that, that God wants you to be victorious. And if you don't believe me, check this out in Revelation chapter 2. And hang on tight because we're going to look at like four scriptures super fast. Revelation 2, in verse 7, he says, Whoever has ears, let them hear to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. In verse 11, to whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt by all, at all by the second death. And verse 17. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who, he, who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the whole one who receives it. And in verse 26, the Bible says, To the one who is victorious... And does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations. Victorious means that it will be hard, but God believes you can overcome. We will leave here today ready to train hard. Hard enough to be qualified. We will be deeply focused and we will continue to fight. 
and we will receive a crown that will last. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage that to continue that counts. I love you guys, and to God be all the glory.